This is CBC Here and Now. I'm here at DFO in St. John's, a warm fire on a cool night and even tents are on the lawn. But these are no happy campers. Protesters gather at DFO. I'll have more in a few moments. Another day in court, the Upper Churchill contract case heads to the Supreme Court of Canada. By whatever means necessary, volunteers try to reunite a war-torn family. We've been working hard to try and uh, find a way to get them over here as well. Rubbish, it's now Core versus Happy Valley Goose Bay in a dispute over garbage. And here in the Weather Center, the snow that you saw there underway already in the St. John's metro region mixes to freezing rain. Significant icing possible overnight in through Friday. The details are coming up. Well, as if making a living from the fishery wasn't hard enough already tonight, it's a little bit harder. Those fishing crab took a 22% quota cut this spring. That's on top of last year's cut. And now some of the fishers can't even get out to catch the shellfish thereafter. And ice is the problem now. For more on that, we go to Here and Now's Chris Ensing, who is live in Twillingate. So Chris, what are you hearing from people on the boats? A lot of frustrations about the ice conditions here. I just spoke with a crew of crab fishermen who said that they're not risking their lives to go out in this ice. But if they're not out catching crab, then they're not making any money. And that's the problem they're facing now. Take a look at these two crab boats here. This was taken just this afternoon around 1 o'clock, just trying to motor and navigate their way through the Twillingate Harbor. It took a matter of hours for them to get over to the ocean. Uh, yesterday, a number of boats went out as well, again, trying to push through this heavy pack ice. Some of the crab fishermen that I spoke with said it's the worst that they've seen in years, but it's not a major problem yet. I'm told that some of the uh, people uh, are facing EI benefit claims that are up at the end of this month or next month, but most of the people I spoke with said they have until June. Now, the weather could help. I'm told that it could be a couple of windy days that push this ice out and suddenly it's not a problem anymore, but it could take weeks for this all to disappear as well. The reason why this has come to uh, a big hit right now is that the FFAW has asked for ice compensation and an extension of EI benefits for the crab fishermen that can't go out onto the water. Now, I spoke with a number of small boat owners as well who say that their boat could handle these ice conditions but the DFO has not opened up their season due to safety issues they tell me uh, now those fishermen are upset and say that if the fishing season was open they'd be able to go out and catch their crab instead of sitting here being frustrated watching other bigger boats go out and do what they think they'd be able to do in these conditions now that's just what's happening here in Twillingate another uh, a bunch of questions that uh, fisher people have for the DFO I understand there was a protest in St. John's today Cecil Hare was covering that. Cecil, what's going on there now? Well, they're just standing around a fire barrel and uh, getting some heat and some warmth on this cold, chilly April evening. Uh, the person at the center of this protest at DFO in St. John's is tucked away in a tent behind me, uh, but he's not a happy camper. Richard Gillett started a hunger strike a week ago today. Things are nice and quiet and calm here now, but it was a bit different earlier this morning. Uh, when folks here started showing up for work, uh, they were delayed, if not stopped, from getting into the DFO parking lot. Uh, some of the fishers came by, and there were protesters, uh, fishermen, crew members, and family and friends of Richard Gillett. He's the man at the heart of this protest. He's trying to get some changes made in the fishery. In the end, uh, today marks the third time in the last three weeks that up operations at DFO have been affected by protests. Protesters say with every species in trouble and deep cuts in how much they can fish, there's less money to earn this year and even worse, less fish and less money to earn in the future. Dad would really like to see me, you know, take over his boat and uh, keep the trend going and my brother's there 100% behind me to support me. and. As I'm standing here today, this is what we're fighting for. I'm fighting for a future for me and for the people who've come behind me. Richard Gillett's hunger strike started a week ago. He's drinking water, not eating food. Today, we were told the vice president of Fish NL wasn't feeling enough to talk with us. He has diabetes and a heart condition. Anybody out there that 
knows Richard Gillett, what he's like when he makes a decision. He makes a decision and he says, he's not moving. So I respect his decision, but no, he's, he's getting weaker. Clary claims that MP Scott Sims, acting as a mediator, made an offer to Gillett on Tuesday in an attempt to get Gillett off the lawn, offered a review of COD stocks, and the next day, DFO announced the review and the FFAW took credit for it. They're playing politics with a man's life. All right, you ask how he's doing, he's not doing well. Is he going to tell you he's not doing well? No, that's not Richard Gillett. He's not doing well and they're playing politics with a man's life. Now, buddy, when Richard mm -hmm. Gillett is here and he's saying that he's ready to die, he's not screwing around. Gillett is demanding a scientific review of all stocks and an independent review of the relationship between DFO and the FFAW. Now, DFO, meanwhile, has not officially responded to Richard Gillett's request, but in a statement today, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans says it does not engage with any person or group that occupies or blocks access to its facilities. Reporting live from DFO in St. John's, I'm Cease Hare. So as we heard from Cease, federal scientists will step up their study of the northern cod stock amid pressure to find out more about the iconic resource as other species decline. DFO will begin full scientific stock assessments in the winter of 2018. The assessments will continue for five years with an annual cost of nearly $3 million to determine if and when the stock can sustain a commercial fishery. While northern cod stocks have been growing since the mid-2000s, the department says numbers are still in the lower half of the so-called critical zone. The Supreme Court of Canada has ordered an RCMP officer in this province to stand trial once again. RCMP Corporal Stephen Blackmore was found not guilty of sexual assault and other charges in June of 2014. Now he'll face those charges again. Here and now's Gwen Payette explains. RCMP Corporal Stephen Blackmore was a happy man when he was acquitted of 10 charges three years ago at Supreme Court in St. John's. They included allegations of sexual assault on one woman, physical assaults on her, and more. Now Blackmore is back to square one. The Supreme Court of Canada has ordered that he stand trial again. Two judges on the appeals court in this province upheld the not guilty verdicts, but there was a dissenting view. The chief justice of the appeals court, Derek Green, disagreed and felt there should be a new trial. So the Crown took the case to the Supreme Court of Canada. Green said the judge at Blackmore's trial had made mistakes. Not only should certain evidence not have been admitted, but other evidence was wrongly excluded. Green said aspects of a sex video and sexually explicit text should not have been allowed at trial, and that witnesses should have been allowed to testify who could back up the complainant's story that Blackmore had assaulted her before she made allegations of sexual abuse against him. Green said given that, the jury may have come to a different verdict. The Supreme Court of Canada agreed with Green and ordered the new trial. Blackmore will be arraigned in Supreme Court in St. John's in May. At that time, he could enter pleas and dates could be set for a new trial. Blackmore was suspended with pay when he was charged in 2012. His status remains the same. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the Supreme Court of Canada has agreed to review the 1969 Churchill Falls energy deal that has been highly profitable for Hydro-Quebec, but much, much less so for this province. The deal has generated more than $26 billion for Hydro-Quebec compared with about $2 billion for Newfoundland and Labrador. This province has gone to court in the past to try to get the, the deal renegotiated. It has argued that the sizable profits from electricity were unfortunate seen in the late 60s and that Hydro-Quebec had a duty to renegotiate the contract. We'll have more on the Supreme Court decision in 20 minutes. Fire broke out in this row of attached homes in downtown St. John's this morning. Firefighters arrived at 52 Monroe Street just after 9 o'clock. There was heavy smoke and fire on the second floor of the house causing major structural damage. It's believed three people were living there, but at the time no one was home.
fire crews did rescue two large dogs. Neighbors were told to leave the adjacent homes while firefighters put out the blaze. There's no word on how much damage there is to the other houses. A man is facing charges after an apparent stabbing followed by a brief standoff at an apartment building in the west end of St. John's. Police were called to a house on Empire Avenue just after midnight, but before they arrived, an injured man was taken to hospital. Officers located the suspect a short time later at a nearby apartment building. The 24-year-old had barricaded himself inside, telling police he was armed. Police negotiators were called in and some residents were told to leave for their safety. The man eventually turned himself in without a problem. The student union at Memorial University is taking another swipe at Munn administration tonight. The two are in a dust up over Munsu's revelation that the university is considering an increase in tuition rates. Now the university says it's inflammatory for the union to release that information while it's still in the discussion stage. The student union is using its Facebook page to talk about what it calls administrative bloat at Munn. It claims the number of managers is growing while the student population is dropping. And Munsu is also taking aim at the salary of President Gary Kachanowski, saying he makes a lot more money than the previous head of the university. Memorial says it is disappointed Munsu is personalizing the issue by attacking its president. Otherwise, a spokesperson says there won't be further comment until after a special meeting of its Senate on Monday. The Child and Youth Advocate says there are serious problems with the way the province provides services to people from other countries. Advocate Jackie Lake Kavanaugh reported this week on a case where children were removed by force from a family that immigrated to Newfoundland and Labrador. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Jackie Lake Kavanaugh says taking the children from their mother was a bad experience for the family, the children, and the people who took them. The removal was a very difficult one. She says when police and social workers arrived, the children's mother, who was visibly pregnant and didn't speak English, wouldn't let them in. Police had to force their way into the home to get the children. Even the professionals afterwards said that it was a very traumatic experience for all involved, the children, the family and the professionals as well. Lake Kavanaugh said mistakes like not bringing an interpreter to speak with the mother showed a lack of cultural sensitivity and she doesn't believe it's an isolated case. We think that these deficiencies are systemic in nature and that really need to be addressed on a broader level. Last month, the provincial government released a strategy to attract more people to this province. Its goal is to increase immigration 50 percent by 2022. The minister responsible for the plan was given a copy of the Child Advocate's report before it was made public. It is a very damning report. It's very, very, very difficult to read it. It's very difficult to hear the story that was contained within. But what also is true is that there's a resolve to fix it. Jerry Burns says the changes recommended in the report have been included in the province's strategy increased coordination within government for more culturally responsive services, greater uh, capacity interpret for interpretation, all elements that were highlighted by the Child, Youth and Family Advocate uh, that were needed in Newfoundland and Labrador. Burns says this province doesn't have a long history of cultural diversity, but he hopes that will change. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And we'll hear much more from the Child Advocate in about 40 minutes. Well, coming up, we're going to find out why uh, Nalcor is burning garbage on its site instead of dumping it here at the landfill in Happy Valley Goose Bay. I didn't like the idea of killing seals on something that was working. So many memories. The seal hunt is in Abraham Kane's blood, right back to his relative, Captain Abram Kane. He'll talk about some family history and we'll take a look back at the seal hunt of yesteryear coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Ryan's here now to look at the weather, and as we heard in the top of the newscast uh, from Chris Ensing in Twillingate, mm -hmm. uh, the sea ice is really causing problems for mm -hmm. people who make a living on the ocean. Yeah, and it's really jammed in there along the north coast and also in the straits where it's causing issues uh, of the Strait of Belle Isle and all along the coast of Labrador. Of course, it's always there, mm -hmm. uh, but also near the Narrows in St. John. So. Uh, Back in November, NASA and uh, NOAA launched this new satellite, GO-16, state-of-the-art. They're testing it out now. They're giving mm -hmm. us some images. And yesterday, they happened to focus on our neck of the woods. And this is a loop from yesterday. And at the beginning of the image, you can actually see the, the lights uh, in the Cornerbrook region, Deer Lake, and the Humber Valley region. And then as the day progresses, of course, the sun rises. And look at the eddies of ice swirling around there off the coast of Labrador. Wow. And there along the north coast, again, it is just packed in there in terms of that sea ice. So uh, some pretty cool shots there. If you want to take a look at this, and I recommend you do take a second look, uh, you can uh, check it out on my Facebook page, uh, Facebook dot com slash Ryan dot and uh, you can uh, yeah have a closer look and you actually uh, zoom back and forth and uh, and have a look at uh, some of those early morning lights are pretty cool before the sun rises I recommend that okay northerly winds continued today and yeah so the pack ice not going anywhere along that north coast and winds light in the strait so yeah no ice moving there also uh, in St. John's that's where the winds have been most sustained from the north raw day for sure it's minus one right now and that is setting the stage for the snow which is already underway and the freezing rain which is to come tonight to central still hanging on to plus two in gander but some snow for you folks as well happy valley goose or uh, grand falls windsor that is we'll get into some flurry action tonight as well but not much in the way of snow happy valley goose bay at plus three right now at labrador city is at plus two there are the special weather statements in effect uh, for along that northeast coast and freezing rain warnings in effect for the avalon including st john's and this is where that significant icing possible and likely for tonight and in through Friday morning and we're talking about 10 to 15 millimeters of precipitation falling here. Much of that will likely be freezing rain, especially for inland areas and higher elevations. So lots of scraping tomorrow before you head out your door. Don't just walk out. Have a good look at the walkway, your driveway, the sidewalks. A lot of ice tomorrow on the go uh, for that northern Avalon metro region back towards the north, uh, uh, northwest Avalon as well. It's going to be mostly snow for Clarenville, Bonavista Bay up towards Terra Nova. Five to as much as 10 centimeters. A bit of mixing here through tomorrow morning before we taper off to flurries. And again, amounts drop off into central. There is the system which is helping to pull, uh, draw, uh, uh, pump some of this moisture into our neck of the woods and this trough line that's been parked just to our east for most of the last couple of days and it is now backing its way into our neck of the woods and you can see where the snow in white and the freezing rain setting up in pink and yes some rain over the southern parts of the Avalon as you saw there on my map mostly rain for the southern Avalon it's going to be mixing more so and that freezing rain potential for the northern Avalon and there's that snow Clarenville Bonavista towards Terra Nova but it doesn't move much further west than that and in fact looking at a very calm and quiet start to the day but a cool one for western parts of Newfoundland it's a quiet start to the day in Labrador as well a couple of flurries possible in Labrador City uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay near minus seven and a few flurries not out of the question towards the Cartwright region as well. As we roll throughout the day tomorrow, this line of precip basically stalls over the Avalon. We will see the steadiest precipitation, the steadiest rain taper into the afternoon, but it looks like still that possibility of some drizzle and freezing drizzle through Friday afternoon, then finally tapering off overnight into Saturday, though that said, patchy light freezing drizzle possible even into Saturday morning and then we'll start to see a bit of a temperature rise for Saturday with a better chance of just drizzle and some fog. We'll break that down with your weekend forecast coming up. So there is the freezing rain for Metro, the rain for the Southern Avalon. The Buren is quiet tomorrow, mainly cloudy three degrees as is the South Coast. We are looking at those flurries for Gander, Twillingate clearing out that messy mix in the morning for Clarenville Bonavista clearing as well. How about the West Coast? 
Boy, oh boy, not a bad week there at all. And you'll uh, cap things off tomorrow with eight degrees in the Cornerbrook region, uh, two in southeastern Labrador. And yeah, those flurry chances and a bit of sun on the go for most of inland areas. That is your forecast weekend details and into next week. Coming up, Debbie. Thanks, Ryan. Well, the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay says Nalcor should stop burning garbage on the Muskrat Falls site, something it's doing with the blessing of the provincial government. The town says burning on site poses an environmental and safety risk, and the garbage should be sent uh, to the town's landfill instead. Here now, Jacob Barker joins us live with more. Jacob? Yeah, well, Nalcor did used to send its garbage to be dumped here just down the road at the landfill in Happy Valley Goose Bay. But about a year ago, the town put in a, a new fee for out-of-town users to tip at the, at the landfill here. And that would hit Nalcor right in its pocketbook. One councillor here thinks that that's the reason that they're burning uh, their garbage on the site instead of shipping it here to be dumped. It's a, it's a direct correlation that they're avoiding having to spend money at the town's landfill for the tipping fees and are burning it on site to the detriment to our environment. Pictures of the burn like this one have ended up in the hands of town councillors. The town says there are three sites at Muskrat Falls where they burn the waste. Nalcor said there has been five controlled burns this year and it burns only waste wood and cardboard. It says it does not burn chemically treated wood, food waste, plastic ha or hazardous materials and there's no anticipated and safety impacts to workers or the public. But others are telling a different story. We've had lots of complaints to councillors uh, from local residents uh, that work on the site. Of course, uh, uh, they've indicated there's materials other than that being burnt. There's pressure treated material, a lot of plywood with glues in it, into it, uh, that sort of, sort of uh, material. Uh, regardless of the material, it's still uh, creating atmospheric pollution. And it's not something that we want in our area when that can be easily mitigated by placing the material into an approved landfill. Now, the provincial government has given Nalcor a permit to be able to burn uh, the, the waste on the site, something that Councillor Chubb says is against their own legislation. The province, however, says that, the, that Nalcor has advised them that the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay initially had concerns about the amount of waste that would be generated by the project and therefore had concerns about the capacity uh, at the dump. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Well, the thick sea ice we were talking about earlier is also causing problems in the Strait of Belle Isle. The Apollo Ferry normally crosses between Blanc Sablon and St. Barb, but because of the ice, Labrador Marine is instead offering passengers flights today and tomorrow. At one point last week, the Apollo was stuck in the ice for 30 hours. Even icebreakers are having a hard time getting through. After the break, Peter Cowan on the decision that will see the province get another day in court to argue for the renegotiation of the Churchill Falls contract.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A Syrian family in Bishop's Falls remains on edge tonight. Five months after they arrived in Canada, they're worried about family members left behind. Here and Now's Garrett Berry has that story. Meet Nora Zalam. Same thing. She came to Bishop's Falls five months ago as a refugee. Fleeing the bombs and destruction in Syria, she says life in her home country is difficult. That's very hard. You, what you, not just scared. You not understand what happened. Yeah. Nora lives with her sister, her mother, and father. But when she came to Canada, she had to leave other family behind. Sisters and nieces in hard situations in Turkey and Rawiya Zalam, still stuck in war-torn Aleppo, one of the centers of the Syrian war with her husband and seven-week-old baby. Now, the group that brought the Zalam family to Bishop's Falls is looking to help out again, trying to get Rawiya out of Aleppo. And, I mean, we took the responsibility of this family, not in anticipation of what was, would follow up, but, you know, as humanitarians, as, as Canadian citizens, as true Newfoundlanders, you just can't leave something like that. So we've been working hard to try and uh, f find a way to get them over here as well. Because Raya is still stuck in Aleppo, she doesn't fit the definition of a refugee. So the Bishop's Falls group is working with a major business in the town to try to bring Raya to Canada using the brand new Atlantic immigration pilot. We're, we're very, very anxious. I, I mean, we, none of us can really, really picture or imagine what these people are going through. Uh, we could talk to the, their family and, and, and get a, a view of what it was like when they were there and, and what they've gone through and everything like this. And, and even when you hear or you see pictures on TV, you, you just can't picture having bombs going off around you every night. There are still several steps left in this effort. First, this business has to get provincial government approval before they can even access the program. Then they have to give Rawia a job offer before she can apply to immigrate to Canada. Safe to say that everyone around here is waiting for that eventual reunion. Garrick Berry, CBC News, Bishop's Falls. The Churchill Falls contract is going all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Today, the court announced it will hear the dispute between this province and Quebec. So, what could this mean? Our Peter Cowan is here to break it down for us. So, Peter, what's the argument here? Well, yeah, Debbie, Nalcor has been trying to convince a judge to change the terms of the Churchill Falls deal with Hydro-Quebec. It's using part of the Quebec Civil Code called the Good Faith Clause, and it's trying to argue that the lopsided nature of the original agreement means it should be revisited. Hydro-Quebec has received $26 billion from selling Churchill Falls power. This province has received $2 billion. Now, so far, that argument hasn't persuaded two different Quebec courts. They've sided with Hydro-Quebec, but officials I've talked to in the Justice Department figured that either way, this was an issue that was likely to land on the Supreme Court's desk, and now they're going to have to settle it. So, Peter, it seems like these legal battles with Quebec have been going on forever. How much is all this costing? Well, yeah, an investigation that I did earlier this year found that this court challenge alone has cost taxpayers about $7 million, and that bill is only going to get higher as lawyers prepare, and then they do the arguments at the Supreme Court. Now, we don't know when that's going to happen, but it's expected sometime in the next year. And if we lose, the Supreme Court will also likely put us on the hook for all of Hydro-Quebec's legal fees as well. But government has argued that since there are billions of dollars at stake, it's worth spending this money. Now, it has the potential to fundamentally change the contract, but it is still a long shot, Debbie. Premier Ball has said uh, in the past he has been talking about with Quebec about future collaborations. How does this court challenge affect things? Well, yeah, Quebec has tried to make this an issue. The Intergovernmental Affairs Minister said that any future partnership would only move forward if Newfoundland and Labrador dropped its legal challenge of the Upper Churchill contract. Now, the possibility that the Supreme Court could rule in Newfoundland and Labrador's favor could now be a bargaining chip to go back to the table with Quebec and say, let's hash this out ourselves rather than relying on the court. But so far, Debbie, there's really been no sign that either side is willing to try and negotiate a deal. So this could be up for the Supreme Court to finally settle. Okay, thanks very much, Peter. You're welcome. I didn't like the idea of killing seals on something. Yes, the seal hunt is in Abraham Cain's blood, and he's related to one of the most famous sealing captains in this province's history. He'll share some family memories, and we'll look back at the seal hunt of yesteryear coming up.
Welcome back. Well, Taylor's has a long tradition of selling seal flippers from its truck on St. John's Harbor front. So you can imagine the interest when the business had a visit from someone whose family connection to the seal hunt stretches back even further. Abraham Kane stopped by the truck to buy some flippers. He's a former sealer, as was his father and grandfather, and he's related to one of the most famous sealing captains in this province's history, Captain Abram Kane, Kane rather, who was his grandfather's brother. Our Bruce Tilly spoke with Abraham Kane about his family history and how important the industry was back in its heyday. My father was all of his life at it, and he used to go with old Abram, the seal killer, and that's where we spent these days. And then he, he got the sealing ship himself, the Viking, and he had a misfortune and she blew up on him. And 27 men got killed, and he only barely made it himself. Your father? My father. Did you go to the ice yourself, sir? Tell me about that. Well, he went to the sail fishery with Captain Charlie Kane in the Taranova. It was something that I wasn't too fussy about. I didn't like the idea of killing seals on Sunday. That was one thing. I didn't like that. And many other things I didn't like. The way you had to do it was different. You know, you didn't know when you were going to be caught out on the ice, a storm or something come up. One night we got out there, because the ship got jammed in the ice, and it was 10 o'clock in the night when they picked us out. That was scary. That was the, the day's conversation when the sealers began to, to go out. Every day somebody would be telling you about the seals and who got them and where they got them. And what, how important was sealing back then to, to the Newfoundland communities? To it, it was very, very important. It was a, it was a, it was a part of their uh, living. Because work wasn't that plentiful like it is now. You had to go to, to the seal fishery. So, that's why it's dying out now. That's so important now as it was then. Are you going to eat some seal flippers? Yes, I got a, a, a meal coming. Now he was going to get me a meal of seal flippers. Well, there is a lot of sealing history connected to the Kane family name. Captain Abram Kane is a famous and controversial figure in the province's past. Many held Captain Kane responsible for the deaths of 78 crew members in the sealing disaster of 1914. Captain Kane sent 132 men from the SS Newfoundland onto the ice where they were stranded and most froze to death. So we dipped into the CBC archives for more history on Captain Kane. Here's an excerpt from a 1982 documentary, Yesterday's Heroes. In 1934, Captain Abram Kane achieved his most ambitious goal. He brought in his one million seal, or to be more precise, as Captain Kane liked to be, his one million eight thousand one hundredth seal. The Board of Trade gave a lavish flipper dinner in his honor, and he was presented with the Blue Ensign by Governor David Murray Anderson. He was awarded the OBE in the birthday honors of King George V, and he began writing his autobiography. Two years later, he retired to his home, the Anchorage on Waterford Bridge Road, where he lived with his eldest daughter and his remaining grandchildren, one of whom attended school with Dr. George Story. I used to go down to school by streetcar, and I'd get on it at the foot of Patrick Street. And um, from the mid-30s on, I can remember very often uh, Captain Kane would have got on a streetcar up at the um, up at the crossroads near Waterbridge Road on his way down, I suppose, to the uh, maybe to the Board of Trade, and um, I, I, I knew who he was uh, 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 from uh, the very earliest days. I always knew who he was. I knew that he was a very famous man, and um, uh, I may have spoken to him a few times too over the uh, you know period of ten or twelve years. On a fine day, he'd walk down Water Street. He was very old then. He was in his 80s, I guess, late 70s, 80s. Uh, 95 was he when he died. He wasn't a tall man, but he was uh, a bit blocky, uh, very sturdy, 
uh, sturdily built and uh, with high color, uh, ruddy, ruddy cheeks. And he had, I think, the, uh, the brightest and most penetrating eyes I've ever seen in my life, blue, piercing blue eyes. Uh, and he walked upright, even as an old man, uh, energetic. Well, I think that, uh, that, that uh, Captain Kane was a, uh, a very remarkable um, a figure in Newfoundland history. And I think, um, all things said, uh, uh, an admirable figure, too. Great to see that old yeah. footage, 1982 documentary. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Now, before we uh, get to our weather today, have a look at this date in St. John's <laughs> one year ago. Yeah, not quite as old as the footage we just saw, but uh, we had a major snowstorm one year ago. Videographer Philippe Grenier was uh, working hard and getting these uh, great shots, trees blowing in the wind, shoveling snow and city crews trying to pick up uh, some uh, garbage in that storm. It was uh, just a rough day for everyone, including me, because the forecast was... Uh, a little higher than anticipated. Uh, we ended up with 20 to 50 centimeters uh, of snow by the time things were said and done on April 21st. Wow. I suddenly it? feel so much better about your forecast <laughs> right now. Yeah. I do not remember that. I think it's a way of keeping my sanity. That's I right. don't yeah. remember these issues. Repressing right. the memory like. <laughs> Anyway, April 20th, one year ago, and you know, that's why I love this time of year, because we can see a little bit of everything from that to our first tropical storm of the season. Yes, very rare. Only the second time in the satellite era that a tropical storm has been named in the month of April. This one is well to our southeast, poses no threat to land, but it is indeed a tropical storm, uh, thanks to the National Hurricane Center, which has been keeping a close eye on this one. It'll get absorbed into this uh, uh, extra tropical low, which is spinning around uh, to our south. And this low is, again, holding hands uh, with this trough line that's been backing in with the precip that's on the way for us and is already rolling in. In fact, with the snow, ice pellets, and then it's freezing rain. Uh, transitioning over the next few hours, uh, certainly by midnight, right across the Avalon, we are looking at that freezing rain, which will then continue overnight in through Friday morning and significant icing looking set for inland higher elevation areas. Definitely, but even uh, most of us uh, looking at uh, some icing here. Southern Avalon, not quite as much uh, where we're going to be seeing Mostly rain with this one, as much as 10, 15 millimeters there. And we are looking at uh, 5 to 10 centimeters Clarenville, Bonavista, edging Terra Nova, Bonavista Bay. That's why the special weather statements are in effect there. A bit of mixing, uh, but amounts will drop off as you work your way into central with just a few flurries, Grand Falls, Windsor. The south coast, the west coast, fairly quiet tomorrow. And in fact, a little on the bright side for Corner Brook with clearing skies into the afternoon. 8 degrees, a beautiful spring day there. Minus 1 Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus 2 in Labrador City. Now as we roll forward, uh, note that that mixing will uh, continue, the freezing rain will continue. By the time we get to Friday afternoon, I think it's more in the freezing drizzle uh, category, not quite as steady in terms of the precip that's falling, but still icing going to remain a concern through Friday night and into Saturday morning where a little glaze could still be picked up by uh, the cars and the roads and the sidewalks. So you're going to want to keep that in mind. By the time we get to Saturday, I think we will see uh, uh, some of that uh, little bit milder air in terms of two degrees and a better chance of uh, some drizzle and fog uh, lingering into Saturday. But uh, uh, scattered flurries on the menu mixed with drizzle in central parts of Newfoundland, sunny breaks for the west and plus four and two and three degrees for you folks in Labrador. Sunday looks like this sun and cloud for western Labrador, uh, coastal flurries for Happy Valley Goose Bay and eastern Labrador. On the island, it's sunny breaks and seven in the west. We are looking at a scattered shower uh, flurry in the morning to shower in the afternoon for central. Scattered showers in St. John's and eastern Newfoundland. This forecast high not as warm as we were talking about 24 hours ago. It looks like we'll have to wait until Monday. Of course, back to work by the time that wind will finally shift in from the south. And we're talking about double digit potential for central and high single digits for the east. It would be nice if that would come Sunday, but at least it's coming at some point. And as 
as we take a look into Labrador again. Uh, not too bad for the weekend, but a bit of a drop off into early next week. Let's meet our young athlete of the day who comes to us from paradise. Chloe Sullivan is eight years old and plays defense with the Orange Furies. Yes, she's part of the Paradise Female Under 9 Hockey League and shares her love of the game with her dad. Congrats, Chloe. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. After the break, more from the child and youth advocate on serious problems with the way the province provides services to people from other countries. Welcome back to Here and Now, and back now to one of our top stories. The Child and Youth Advocate report on how an immigrant family was treated when their children were taken away. Jackie Lake Cavanaugh spoke with Here and Now's Mark Quinn about what changes need to happen as this province embarks on recruiting people from around the globe. When the social workers and the police uh, went to the family home, uh, the mother couldn't speak English well and asked that they come back at a later time. And so both the social workers and the police officers at the scene consulted with their supervisors and they were instructed to proceed with removing the children in the interest of the children's protection. So the removal did take place, but the mother uh, was reluctant to um, provide entry. So there had to be a forced entry into the home. So of course that escalated the whole uh, situation and the difficulty for everybody that was involved in that case. If we're inviting families from all over the world to come to Newfoundland and Labrador, we really need to be able to make sure that we can respond and provide effective responses, supports, services, and, and help them settle here. So uh, we had talked about in the recommendation the need for enhanced uh, interpreting services and the availability uh, of interpreting. Uh, we also talked about the need for training frontline service providers that would have helped in this situation. And we also, as part of that recommendation, asked AESL uh, to bring other departments together and to look at where there may also be other gaps in the system so that they can address those in these kinds of situations. So when I read the report, there were, there were sort of two things that jumped out at me. One was the, the removal, which we've talked about. Yes. The second bit I think that <coughs> I thought about was, um, you know, the services that were provided to the children after they were removed. Yes. You found some problems with that. I wonder if you could talk about that. 
when the children were removed, um, there was concern there about the, uh, the lack of counseling or debriefing services, the mental health response uh, for the children. There was also concern about uh, their access to um, religious services. Uh, so those were the kinds of things that were, were problematic. The other uh, thing that we identified was that um, there really needed to be more interpretation services available so that for families for whom English is not their first language, uh, some of these matters can be very complex. You know, you're dealing with um, pretty complex policies. The issues are critically important if it's, you know, whether or not your child can live with you or not or, or is in care. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're dealing with court orders. There was a warrant uh, in, in this particular case for the removal of the children. So the interpreting services are also really, really important. Is this a really isolated rare case or is this sort of thing happening? I'm not sure about the actual statistics or numbers, Mark, but I wouldn't necessarily say that it's rare now. It's probably not a common occurrence every day either. But we thought it was significant enough so that we would issue these recommendations because we do believe that the, the concerns are systemic in nature. It was this one family that was identified and, and addressed in this particular investigation and report. But with these deficiencies that were there, it could have been any number of families that could have been involved in this situation. And with the province's push now to um, invite more people to come to the province, it's really important that we can respond in a more culturally sensitive way. Well, it looks like there's a new player in the world of air travel, a so-called ultra low cost option. It's actually a familiar name. WestJet says it will unveil plans to launch the new airline later this year. As with the main airline, the stripped down carrier will fly only 737s. It'll start out with 10 aircraft. WestJet says its new offering will cater to Canadians who don't want frills, just the lowest possible price. Well, check out this herd's eye view of a group of female caribou traveling in Canada's north. Yes, this is a, a project by researchers from Laval University to study newborn calves. Scientists are trying to get insights into the animal's behavior at the individual and population level. Now, this research comes as the federal government faces a lawsuit. An environmental group is suing Canada's environment minister for not doing enough to protect woodland caribou and its habitat. Well, Toronto's Air Canada Centre is quite the busy place these days. And that's because both the Maple Leafs and the Raptors are in the playoffs, so there's a lot of postseason work for the crew, transforming the basketball court into a hockey rink and then back again. This is time-lapse video. As you can see, the crew is turning the Raptors' court back into an ice surface. Well, some big news in the world of sports. Serena Williams is having a baby. The powerhouse tennis superstar announced that she's 20 weeks pregnant with her first child. Mm -hmm. If we do the math properly, that means Williams was about eight weeks pregnant when she beat her sister Venus at the Australian Open. And not only did she win, she didn't drop a set throughout the whole tournament.
We have a first of its kind discovery to show you now. A true wonder of the natural world. Slimy creatures that could leave you a bit squeamish. So you've been warned. Here's the big reveal. Oh my. <laughs> that is a giant shipworm. It's not a worm, oh. though. It's a bivalve related to oh, oh. My <laughs> clams. The creature's tusk-like shells have been prized by collectors for centuries. Now naturalists have discovered living ones for the first time in the mud in a Philippines lagoon. We should have had a clam. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, as nasty. long as we saw Carolyn's face. Okay, um, well, as if you needed another reason to love the Harlem Globetrotters. There it is. <laughs> he has a couple of the guys caught a ride on a Toronto street car to cheer up some commuters. They showed off some basketball tricks and gave away free tickets to their upcoming show and maybe even inspired some new fans. <laughs> <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah, I do have You're a stick. Yeah. <laughs> this, is a stick. this is for protection <laughs> this time of year. Uh, snow, two to five centimeters. Uh, looks like we'll be on the very low end of that as we're already seeing some ice pellets and freezing rain mixing in. Again, it's a uh, 10 to 15 millimeters of uh, icing across the northern Avalon. It's all snow west of the Avalon. And uh, before I explain why I've got the stick, let's take a look at our beautiful viewer picture of the day. Oh, uh, nice. Tina on the Spurwink Island path of the East Coast Trail. And note in the background that very famous Fairyland iceberg. Oh, that is Great fantastic. Picture. Isn't it? That's probably going to go global just like the iceberg shot I did. I think so. <laughs> so what's with the stick? <laughs> uh, tonight, mile one, 7.30 puck drop. It's uh, the local media uh, all-stars versus mm -hmm. the much better police all-star team. Uh -huh. And it's all for charity. The NL Police Curling Association puts it off. Tourette Society of Newfoundland, Great. Easter Seals, and many others uh, get uh, some money from that. So if you're looking for something to do, 7.30 at mile one. Mm. Okay, have a Good great luck. game. Thank See you. See you tomorrow.